Thank you for joining us for this session, The Importance of Genetics and Biomarkers, presented by Dr. Anna Jo Smith. Dr. Smith is an attending surgeon and instructor in gynecologic oncology at the University of Pennsylvania. Her work focuses on how to improve equitable delivery of evidence-based gynecologic care through innovative program and policy design. We'd like to thank AstraZeneca for making this session possible. We'd also like to extend our thanks to program supporters, AstraZeneca, GSK, Merck, and Mersana Therapeutics. So I'm Anna Jo Badurtha Smith. I'm a GYN oncologist at the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm very excited to be here on behalf of OCRA today. I'll be talking about genetics and biomarkers in ovarian cancer. So I have no relevant financial relationships, and I'm not talking about any unimproved or investigated use of commercial products or devices today. I do have a number of research awards and grants um, that do not overlap with the content of the presentation today. Um, so a couple caveats before we get started. This is a rapidly evolving area of care, both with new biomarkers being discovered as well as new germline genetics mutations being discovered every few years. You and your clinical team need the whole clinical picture to use genetics and biomarkers in your year. And what I say today may be out of date in six months, 12 months, um, but should provide a foundation for understanding biomarkers and genetics in your care. Um, and then I am also the daughter of a geneticist. So this is something that I've been thinking about, talking about um, from as early as I can remember. This is actually The Adventures of Jean was a coloring book um, that my babysitter, who's also one of the genetic counselors, made when I was a kid. Um, so we will try to have some adventures with genes and biomarkers today. So our objectives are to define genetics and biomarkers in oncology and to discuss the role of genetics and biomarkers in ovarian cancer care both in the front line and the recurrence setting. So we'll start with some definitions. First of all, what is genetic testing? So genetic testing is the process through which a blood or saliva, te saliva test may help determine if you have a gene associated with increased risk of ovarian or other cancers. And this blood or saliva test looks to see if you're carrying a gene change passed down to you by one of your parents that can be associated with increased cancer risk. Um, so two ways to obtain genetic testing results. Um, one, it can be due to their blood samples, so routine lab draw. The other option is through a buccal or a cheek swab, as illustrated in this um, picture. Um, both of those collect cells, which are then sort of spun in the lab, and you extract DNA and you get a test result. Genetic counseling is the process through which a genetic counselor, which is a trained medical professional who specializes in genetics, sort of ask you a series about you and your family's cancer history, as well as your heritage. This can help tailor what type of genetic testing they recommend for you and your family. Um, and your practice may have different ways of doing this. Um, some practices sort of recommend genetic testing and then refer every patient to genetic counseling. Some practices do genetic, genetic testing within the clinic and then you sort of meet with the genetic counselor after you undergo genetic testing. Um, there are different types of pathogenic variants. Um, which is what genes are. So genes are like sentences in a chapter, and there's sort of a standard version um, that can sort of be our normal version. And then what we're concerned about is a pathogenic variant or something that can be causing sort of disease processes, and in this particular instance, increase your cancer risk. And these can be typos that lead to sort of repetition of things, or they can be typos that lead to sort of changes in the proteins or other structures. And the reason we're concerned about this in ovarian cancer is one, that there are hereditary cancer syndromes. So these are cancer syndromes that may also be called inherited cancer syndromes, genetic cancer syndromes, or family cancer syndromes. These are specific genetic mutations that increase the risk of certain types of cancer. And I highlighted here the most common hereditary cancer syndromes that are associated with ovarian cancer, some of which you may have heard of, some of which you may have not. So BRCA1 or 2 are probably the best known ovarian cancer syndromes. In addition to the ovarian cancer risks, they are associated with breast, pancreatic, and skin cancers. The other most common one is called Lynch syndrome or hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer. Um, this actually has five genes that can be associated with it. It's associated with the risk of ovarian cancer, both our most typical type of high-grade serous, as well as endometrial um, ovarian cancer, as well as being associated with uterine, colon, and bladder cancer. And then there's some less common hereditary cancer syndromes um, like ATM or STIC11, Pussy Acres, that can also be associated with ovarian cancer. And these can also be associated with less common types of ovarian cancer, such as sex sports, stromal tumors, and Pussy Acres syndrome. 
And so we're looking for a genetic testing. We can either choose to test for a single gene, say only test for BRCA1, or we can test for a panel of genes. And these panels of genes for hereditary cancer syndrome range from anywhere from 20 to 70 plus genes. And most places you'll find if you're considering genetic testing will opt for the panel of genes because there now are more than 10 genes that have been associated with ovarian cancer risk that sort of are listed below. Um, so that's one thing is that if you're considering genetic testing, ask, well, what are we testing for and how many genes are we testing for? One sort of reminder is if you were tested in the past just for BRCA1 or 2, which used to be the practice of just doing the single gene testing, you may want to get tested again for a panel of genes to have that more broader understanding. And then also if you had genetic testing prior to 2010, when we were sort of doing more limited testing, even for patients with BRCA1 and 2, you may want to consider repeating your testing. So that's germline genetics or something that we inherit from our parents that's carried through all of our cells. So biomarkers are actually what's in the tumor or in our blood um, that's sort of related to the cancer rather than our own germline genetics. So biomarkers also can be known as molecular testing and the use of biomarkers in oncology care is called precision medicine or precision oncology. The biomarker is the thing that is measured or detected. And biomarkers may provide a multitude of information. This can be information about cancer risk, cancer diagnosis, the most effective treatment plan, response to treatment, and cancer recurrence risk. We don't have biomarkers for all of these things in ovarian cancer yet, but this is an active area of research we're trying to develop. What you're probably familiar with is that the CA125 was actually the first biomarker developed in any cancer type is something we use in ovarian cancer to both help with diagnosis as well as monitor response to treatment and assess recurrence. Biomarker testing is when we're actually using technological means to measure or detect a biomarker. Again, biomarkers overall refer to the cancer, not your genes. This is the test of the cancer's characteristics. Um, biomarker testing may involve testing the tumor from a prior surgery or prior biopsy. Occasionally, it can involve biopsy for new testing of a tumor, and occasionally it can involve blood tests. Blood tests are commonly used for biomarker testing in other cancers, such as lung cancer, but aren't quite ready for prime time in ovarian cancer. And so this testing may involve staining of your tumor for proteins or immunologic markers to help determine what chemotherapies or immunotherapies your tumor might respond best to. It can also involve next generation sequencing, we're actually looking at the DNA or RNA of the tumor to identify targets for treatment. And so the thing that we'll continue exploring for the rest of the talk is sort of the difference between genetics and biomarker testing. So again, with germline genetics, we're testing your genes, what's inherited through your appearance. With your biomarkers, we're testing your tumor and sort of characteristics of the tumor. Both can be tested with blood. Germline genetics can also be tested with saliva. Biomarkers usually result, rely on biopsy of the tumor as well. Both can be relevant to your family, but positive germline genetics um, are very relevant to your family, as we'll discuss later on. Both are relevant, can be relevant to your cancer treatment. Germline genetics is stable over time versus biomarkers may change over your disease course. Um, and both germline genetic testing as well as biomarker testing are universally recommended in ovarian cancer meaning that the national international recommendations are that any patients diagnosed with ovarian cancer should undergo both germline genetics as well as some level of biomarker testing. In endometrial cancer, biomarker testing, which we won't go into a lot more detail for endometrial cancer, but some level of biomarker testing is recommended for all patients with endometrial cancer. And germline genetics may also be recommended for some patients with endometrial cancer. So let's dive more into the genetic or germline testing component. So the reason this is so relevant in ovarian cancer is actually one in four patients with ovarian cancer have a germline genetic mutation. I used to think it was much lower, but these are not just genes like BRCA1 or 2. There's sort of a whole variety of other genes, ATM, PALB2. Um, and so it's really important to diagnose this. In addition to the one in four patients who have a germline genetic mutation, additional one in four have a mutation in their tumor, something called homologous repair deficiency. Um, so we have about 50% of newly diagnosed ovarian cancer patients that have either a mutation in their own genes or a mutation in their tumor. And then the other 
don't have this sort of particular type of mutation. And the reason this is so important is they're actually targeted drugs for patients that have this homologous repair deficiency, either in their germline, their own genes, or in their tumor. So with a medication called a PARP inhibitor, there's a 70% decrease in the risk of recurrence or death when you go on a PARP inhibitor after maintenance, after original chemotherapy, which is really a blockbuster drug. Um, and this is showing on the sort of right that really it changes progression-free survival, where Unfortunately for most patients with advanced stage ovarian cancer, most will recur within two years of their diagnosis. But for patients, again, the 50% that either they or their tumor have this particular characteristic, we can extend progression-free survival, keep them healthy and living well with their disease for more than threefold the amount of time without, as compared with all PARP inhibitors. Um, and this sort of illustration is to illustrate that for patients, many of whom are sort of in the sort of becoming a grandparent age, this difference in progression-free survival, which now has been shown improvements in overall survival, may make the difference between quality time with their grandkids or not. So it's really important because of this um, to get genetic testing, which is why it's now recommended. Yet we know that nationally only one in three patients with ovarian cancer ever get genetic testing, um, which means that so if we have 50% that either they or their tumor has this particular type of mutation, it means that one third of patients who have this mutation will never get testing and they're missing the opportunity for a very beneficial medication. Um, and these slides are thank you to one of our genetic counselors who's been working hard at increasing our own genetic testing. Rates. In addition, there are disparities in genetic testing in ovarian cancer. This is a paper we published recently looking at sort of racial, ethnic insurance and other disparities. And we found is that insurance, unfortunately, is a big driver for whether patients get genetic testing with patients who have Medicare are being 10% less likely to get genetic testing ever. Um, and though even though the recommendation is for every patient with ovarian cancer to get genetic testing, patients who had um, sort of the less classic histology, such as an endometrioid histology, are 15% less likely to get testing even though this may still very much be associated with their hereditary cancer syndrome. And these patients are also um, recommended to get PARP inhibitors if they have either the mutations in their own genetics or in their tumor. So we talked about why genetic testing is important for your cancer treatment for consideration of PARP inhibitor maintenance therapy in the unprep setting. The other area where genetic testing or germline genetic testing would be really important is for considering clinical trial eligibility. Um, at a lot of sites, we have specific clinical trials that are open to specific populations of patients. We, for example, at Penn have a large trial that's open to patients who have a germline BRC1 or 2 mutation. And so we have to know whether or not you have the mutation to understand whether you'd be eligible for that trial, um, which is the other reason to strongly consider it, in addition to the only additional that um, PARP inhibitors. So how do you get germline genetic testing? Most of the time, um, sort of this will be something that your oncologist talks to you about in the clinic. Um, they may either perform or order the testing in clinic, or may do it through a genetic counselor, hereditary cancer clinic. Um, there also are some direct-to-consumer testing options, even for cancer genetics. Um, all of these are valid opportunities, although I'd say if you're sort of obtaining it through your oncologist or through a genetic counselor, you're going to get very strong counseling about the risks and benefits of testing, as well as sort of counseling about the results and implications of your practice, um, which are very important for you. So what types of results can you get if you undergo genetic testing? So as we talked about, about one in four patients with ovarian cancer will have what's called a positive genetic test result, also known as a pathogenic variant. Um, and this may be, you can also get something that's a likely pathogenic variant, which means something we think is likely to be positive and impact your care if we don't have quite enough data yet. Um, you can also get a variant of unknown significance. Um, most of variants of unknown significance are reclassified as negative in the future, although about one in five may be classified as pathogenic in the future, so something to follow. Um, you may get a negative result, and very rarely you get an insufficient sample. Most of the time, if you get an insufficient sample, it's because you didn't get quite enough cheek swabs, and the um, labs will do a blood test to make the results happen. And so we talked about why genetic testing is important for your health. And the other reason it, it's important for your family as well. So if you test positive for a germline genetic mutation or hereditary cancer syndrome, using both of those terms pretty interchangeably, 
Your first degree relatives, that is your sister, brothers, children, parents, should also be tested. All of these genes are autosomal dominant, meaning that you have a 50% chance of passing them on to sisters, to, sorry, to children. Um, and then they most of the time are inherited for one or both of your parents, which is why I said of testing that first degree relative is important. Um, a lot of patients don't want to disclose that they have these um, genetic testing. And so that's where talking to a genetic counselor, or clinical team, can be very important for how to approach testing your family members. We find that when sort of our patients um, actually talk with their family members, many family members do want to get tested and they're very open to the results. Um, and so you can really brainstorm with your clinical team how best to approach that. You don't feel comfortable yourselves, as well as the really wonderful um, sort of resources both from the OCRA as well as some other websites I'll mention later about how to sort of work through that in your family. And the reason that's important is there are ways to prevent cancer in individuals who have a germline genetic mutation or hereditary cancer syndrome. And so by helping all of our patients who are eligible for testing, such as all patients with ovarian cancer, get tested and then test their first degree relatives, we really hope that we can prevent cancer in future generations. So when should you have genetic testing? It's typically done within the first one to six months of ovarian cancer diagnosis to make that decision about maintenance therapy. Um, and then, um, is also recommended if a first degree relative tests positive for a germline genetic variant. So if you happen to have a sister that undergoes testing um, and tests positive for say ATM, it would be recommended that you and sort of all of their first degree relatives get tested as well. Who has access to genetic testing results? They are only you and your clinical team as well as the genetic testing company. Um, genetic testing results are protected by HIPAA and the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act meaning that both your employer and insurance companies can't use the information against you or disclose it. Um, the only areas where we do run into some issues um, is life, disability, and long-term care insurance. If you're newly obtaining those services, they can ask for genetic testing results um, and sort of may limit policies, again, just for life, disability, and long-term care insurance. And if you happen to test positive for a genetic mutation, although we've also had plenty of patients who have issues with so most of the time, um, genetic testing is fully covered by insurance after a cancer diagnosis. Um, but do let your family, do let your care team know if you experience financial toxicity or are unable to afford your testing. Um, if you do test positive or if a family member tests positive, most genetic testing companies will test family members at a substantial discount. Um, some of the companies we work with will test family members for anywhere from fifty to one hundred dollars um, after a family member tests positive, which is lower than sort of the average out of pocket cost of these, which is anywhere from most insurances at zero to like about two or three hundred dollars for testing. So again, genetic testing is recommended for all patients with ovarian cancer. So it is something to talk with your doctor about if you have in genetic testing. Ask about how and when you should get genetic testing after an ovarian cancer diagnosis. Um, as we talked about, this is the genetic testing may be one ways to reduce the risk of ovarian cancer in future generations, um, an OCRA has really wonderful resources about on its website as well as um, also available for the patient support line about how to sort of think about this, get access to care and guide you through next steps. So that's a lot on germline genetics. We're going to take a step back and rather than talk about your genes, we're going to talk about the tumor gene. And so we'll talk about biomarker testing. So again, biomarker testing is the technological means to measure detective biomarkers. We're testing the cancer, your gene, not your genes. And so usually it involves testing from a biopsy or tumor. Occasionally may require a new biopsy. And not yet in ovarian cancer, but maybe in the next couple of years, can involve a blood test. And then we're doing additional staining of that to identify the genes of the tumor. So biomarker testing is important um, because it may allow for targeted cancer treatment or targeted clinical trials. Um, so for example, We've talked about PARP inhibitor therapy in ovarian cancer. The one in four patients have a germline genetic mutation, and the one in four have a somatic or a tumor mutation that makes them highly likely to respond to a um, PARP inhibitor. And so that's a biomarker that helps guide standard treatment options because it means that these patients are highly likely to respond to the PARP inhibitor therapy. That said, not in every identified mutation or biomarker has a targeted therapy yet, 
although that's one of the really exciting things in oncology right now is we're actively working to identify better biomarker targeted treatments. So one example of this is actually a newly approved, um, approved last fall of a medication that's called Mervituxab. So this is a newly FDA approved treatment for platinum resistant ovarian cancer in patients that have had one to three prior um, and it is the first, um, one of the first sort of specific approvals based on the um, tumor in the recurrent set. So this is specifically for tumors that express high levels of folate receptor alpha. Um, about 70% of ovarian cancers express some level of folate receptor alpha. And about 35% of recurrent platinum resistant ovarian cancers express this high level. But for patients that whose tumors express this high rate of um, folate receptor alpha, who are platinum resistant and recurrent, um, the clinical benefit rate, um, meaning stable disease, if not response to treatment, um, is about 50% in rivotoximab, which is one of the highest response rates we've seen in platinum resistant ovarian cancer. So really exciting sort of use of a biomarker targeted treatment um, for to develop a new treatment to benefit patients with and there are lots of sort of ongoing development um, and we're really excited to think we actually should have even more treatments in this state in the next couple of years. Just another example of sort of how this is used in a clinical trial. Um, this is my colleague Fiona Simpkins' trial called PRE. And um, we're using a combination of two agents um, for patients that have previously benefited from a PARP inhibitor. Um, and so they're taking patients that who have a germ who either have they themselves a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, or their tumor has it, or they have that. BRCA like homologous repair deficiency in their tumor. Um, and then these patients are after they have a PARP inhibitor and have disease that progresses, so grows in a PARP inhibitor. We're adding another agent to see if the combo um, is helpful. And this is some preliminary results um, on the left that have showed a really positive response when we add the second agent um, to PARP inhibitors. So, again, just an example of a targeted trial where we're selecting a group that's more likely to respond to a particular medication. So, how do you get biomarker testing? So, again, so this is typically from either prior biopsy and new biopsy. And so, it's usually arranged through your oncology clinical team. Most oncologists will work with a national company, um, although there are some large health systems and some large hospitals that do the testing in house. Um, they do have to either get a new biopsy or obtain old tumor samples from the pathology lab. That is a lot of the time delay instead of saying, oh, yes, we're going to do biomarker testing, getting the prior biopsy or a new biopsy needed, getting the slides and mailing them to the testing company takes time. Um, sort of in our process, it takes anywhere from two to four weeks just to get sort of the samples and everything collected and get the staining. And so it can take about anywhere from four to eight weeks to get biomarker testing results back from when you start. Um, and you will receive a call from the national company prior to them running the test, just to discuss the test and the cost. We wanna make sure that patients, the companies that most oncology practices work with, wanna make sure that patients are informed about the results and know what the costs will be um, prior to running them. So when should you get biomarker testing? Um, so in ovarian cancer biomarker testing, um, is recommended in the frontline setting, so when you're first diagnosed, if your genetic testing is negative, to identify those patients who have their tumors or sort of have homologous repair deficiency. Um, and then it's also recommended at recurrence because we now have these targeted agents like mervituximab that we can offer to patients when they recur if their tumor has specific targets. Um, and that sort of is a rapidly evolving area of research. Um, so two things just to point out. Um, right now, we think biomarkers are fairly stable in ovarian cancer. Um, so they are usually able to use people's original tumor, either from their first biopsy, which got them a diagnosis, or for surgery, um, which really has been able to minimize repeat biopsies. There's a chance this may change as we sort of better understand how tumors change with ovarian cancer treatment lines. So there's a chance that your clinical team may recommend another biopsy for biomarker testing if needed. Um, and then this is a rapidly evolving area. So, for example, mervituximab, that new drug that came out last fall, we had to go back and ask the lab to retest all of our patients for folate receptor alpha. Um, and so even if you don't need a new sample, we may have to go back as we sort of discover new biomarkers and discover new treatments. We may have to go back to your original tumor and do more testing. So what are the financial implications of biomarker testing? 
So usually insurers will cover biomarker testing at diagnosis or at recurrence up to once a year for cancer. Um, so it is covered by insurance companies. However, the copay is likely higher than the germline genetic testing, um, and you will likely have a copay associated with testing. That is why companies call you and sort of discuss the cost um, prior to them running the test. Um, if the testing is not covered by your insurance, you think you'll struggle with the cost, um, please let your care team know. Most places will have programs in place to help patients with the cost. Um, and then you can also check the website or talk with the testing company directly for assistance programs. My dad actually had biomarker testing fairly recently. I've written about this and sharing the story with his permission. Um, and they unfortunately messed up and they sent him the bill for all of the testing at once, which is about $5,000 with no insurance company, no insurance coverage. Um, and he understandably sort of um, was quite flustered with that. Um, and then sort of, even though we sort of got that bill on them, we were able to work with both his insurance and sort of his um, testing company and the cost was much, much less than that um, at the end of the day. So um, sometimes there are billing issues with this. Again, go back to your insurer and go back to the testing company and there really are assistance programs and let your clinical team know if you do get a bill like that or a struggle with the cost. Um, and then there are some clinical trials that will cover the cost of your testing. So questions to ask your doctor about biomarker testing. I think the first question to ask is, have I had biomarker testing? You may find that you already have had some level of biomarker testing. Um, most places will do some level of protein testing and other staining whenever you have a biopsy or surgery. And so getting those results back. Um, then after asking if you've had testing, ask, are there biomarkers that could provide information about chemotherapy, targeted therapy, or clinical trial options for me? And if your clinician says, oh, yes, yeah, so let's proceed with biomarker testing, ask about what company will perform the testing, um, just because, again, that company will call you prior to running the test. Um, and then ask, how will the test results influence my treatment options? What are we thinking about doing with these? Ask them about their own experience of how long it takes the results back. Some places may take shorter, some places may take longer, just need at least one to two months on average. Um, and then get a ask to get a copy of your results. I think that's helpful to have, again, as things evolve, as things change, um, to have that in your hand, to understand what's been tested, um, what the results are, and then sort of are things going to change? Would testing be needed again? So again, sort of circling back at the end, the difference between genetics and biomarker testing. Germline genetics and biomarker testing are universally recommended in ovarian cancer with germline genetics for doing a blood or saliva test to test your own genes. With biomarker testing, where you're doing a biopsy, we're typically using a biopsy or surgery to test your tumor. Um, germline genetics can be highly relevant to family, um, and occasionally biomarkers can identify that you are highly likelihood of having a high, you are high likelihood of having a germline genetic mutation. So sometimes this can be relevant to your family as well. Both are highly relevant to your cancer treatments. Right now, we, we know germline genetics don't change over time. It's something you're born with. Biomarkers may change over time, which may be why in the future we do do some repeat testing. Both are universally recommended in ovarian cancer. Biomarker testing is universally recommended in endometrial cancer. So again, as we started with, as with the adventures of gene, this is a highly evolving field. Um, we are constantly identifying more hereditary cancer syndromes or new germline genetic mutations. We're moving towards blood-based biomarker testing. Some other cancer areas are here. We're not yet there in ovarian cancer. You may have heard that called cell-free or circulating tumor DNA, really hoping that will be something that's sort of available and the technology works in the next couple of years. Um, and then the real goal of this is to improve precision oncology, um, where we're able to develop more targeted cancer treatments, sort of you know, as a positive biomarker, and then offer them a targeted treatment based on their biomarker with the goal of minimizing side effects and maximizing response to treatment. And so um, we will continue to have adventures with genes um, as we go. Um, these are my references. I am putting here some di di um, dictionaries of common cancer terms, um, as well as the Patient Advocate Foundation has really good resources on types of biomarker testing um, and just doing a big patient focused campaign around biomarker testing. Um, and these are some resources um, for the OCRA, as y'all know by being here today. Um, as well as there are specific focus, um, specific groups focused on particular types of hereditary cancer syndromes, as well as patients, patients with hereditary cancer syndromes overall. Um, and then the, obviously the American Cancer Society and CDC have really good resources.
Um, and thank you to my patients, my coworkers, um, our research group, which is really focused on reducing disparities in care. Um, and thank you, of course, to the Varian Cancer Research Alliance. As I mentioned, this is a rapidly evolving field. And um, the good thing is I actually have a pet rabbit that really likes eating medical journals. So this is her on the bottom after devouring um, yet another journal um, with advances in genetics biomarkers and the variant. So thank you for your time.